Welcome to the BTM channel's 41st episode for technology and innovation. We live in the age of the iPhone and the Android device, so there doesn't seem to be anything extraordinary about instant photography. You point your phone at a target and click a button. Instantly, a 4K image is saved in the device's storage. No muss, no fuss. The only limit on the number of high quality photographs that can be taken is the amount of storage on the device. So what happened before 2007, the year the iPhone 1 was introduced? Well, you couldn't take ultra high resolution 4K pictures in 2007, but you could take a 1080p picture on a digital camera. This was a lot more inconvenient than taking pictures with an iPhone. Digital cameras were expensive and often bulky if feature rich. But like the iPhone, the only limit to the number of pictures you could take was the amount of storage on the camera. Digital cameras were introduced in 1988 and were widely available by 1995. Okay, so what happened before 1995 if you needed to take instant photographs? The answer to this $36 billion question, of course, is that you used an analog camera. And not just any analog camera, you used a Polaroid camera, the only camera capable of taking instant photographs. In this video, we examine the Polaroid analog instant photo camera in the form of a 1-step 600 flash close-up. But since this is the Belated Tech channel, we will first take a plunge into the past during the period between 1932 and 1988, the golden age of analog photography in general and instant photography in particular. Through the past, we better understand the present. What if I asked you to name the 20th century's analog to Google or Tesla? What companies would you think of? General Electric, IBM, Ford? Those companies are certainly historic, but were they truly revolutionary, consistently innovative? If you picked AT&T's Bell Labs, you would be closer to the real answer, although the Allentown, Pennsylvania-based Research and Development Center, or even Xerox's Palo Alto, California-based Park, were not truly comparable to Apple or Facebook. For most of the 20th century, one company every chemist, industrial engineer, product designer, and optical physicist, among many other professions, wanted to work for was Polaroid. Polaroid was the cool company, the trendsetter whose CEO hobnobbed with Andy Warhol and Ansel Adams, with US presidents and Hollywood stars, and with athletes and five-star generals. Polaroid revolutionized optical technology during the Great Depression, developed key technologies that helped win World War II, invented instant photography for the baby boomer generation, successfully competed with photography and printer giant Kodak, and initiated a number of key new technologies in the latter part of the 20th century that had a profound impact on the beginning of the 21st. But perhaps most importantly, Polaroid's impact on culture and art has had no corporate equal before its founding and perhaps since. Polaroid was founded near Boston, Massachusetts by a Harvard University student named Edwin Land and his physics instructor, George Wheelwright. Called the Land Wheelwright Laboratories, the company was formed to commercialize Land's discoveries in optical technology. After a few early successes developing inexpensive polarizing materials for sunglasses and photographic filters, Land obtained funding from a series of Wall Street investors for further expansion, changing the company's name to Polaroid in 1937. Polaroid became a critical business during World War II, designing bomb sites for the U.S. Army Air Force and equipment for ground troops. As a result, the number of employees at the company exploded, which became a significant problem in 1945 at the end of the war. Land needed an idea to avoid layoffs. That idea was the Land Instant Photographic Camera, which he conceived in 1943. Land and his scientists were able to perfect the device and demonstrated the first model of the camera in 1947 in New York at an optics convention in Hotel Pennsylvania. The camera was a hit and the company sold every unit it had on hand. Polaroid continued to grow in the 1950s and 1960s as it improved its cameras and produced products for both high-end photography and the mass market. The instant camera gained so much market share that Kodak decided to introduce a competing device in 1976. Polaroid immediately sued for patent infringement and ultimately won its case, effectively freezing the market for instant cameras and solidifying its position. Unfortunately, this legal victory merely heralded the coming decline of Polaroid and not its ultimate triumph. 
in the late 1970s, Land attempted to introduce an instant film movie camera to the market, where it ultimately flopped in the face of Sony's Betamax videotape technology. There was a board revolt, and Land was forced out of the chairmanship and relegated to an honorary role. He retired in disgust in 1982, cashed out his stock, and cut ties to the company he had founded and fostered for 50 years. In a pattern that would be repeated hundreds of times in other World War II era companies in the 1980s, new management attempted to diversify from the company's core product while simultaneously pleasing Wall Street. That isn't to say that Polaroid didn't continue to innovate. The company was one of the pioneering inventors of the charge-coupled device sensor that made digital cameras possible and invented inkless printing that later became commercialized by Polaroid spin-off Zinc. The diversification didn't work, and a later turnaround effort in 1995 failed. In 2001, Polaroid went bankrupt. The company, whose stock had peaked at $36 billion in the late 1980s, was now worth zero. Similar to what happened to Franklin Computer, as outlined in our episode 40, a brand aggregator bought Polaroid out of bankruptcy, but the buyer was not interested in making cameras and film, and ended production of both by 2005. Then the buyer went bankrupt, and Edwin Land's Polaroid Corporation disappeared into history. Polaroid had produced a dizzying array of cameras to the market during its 70-year run, but the underlying technology differed little during that time. Polaroid film, unlike standard analog film, comes with both the photosensitive chemicals on the film as well as the developing chemicals required to fix the image permanently. The camera applies the developer to the film when it ejects the print. Starting in 1972 with the SX-70 camera, Polaroid instant photography became affordable for the general public, who bought the simple cameras by the hundreds of thousands. The SX-70 series was succeeded in 1983 by the 600 series of cameras. For this episode, we have obtained a 600 series camera, the One Step 600 flash close-up, produced from 1997 to 2002. The One Step 600 camera produced prints 3.1 inches square with a white border that, that takes only about three minutes to fully develop at 70 degrees Fahrenheit. All 600 film has an ISO rating of 640. Let's put our hands on the One Step 600 flash close-up and explore its characteristics and features. This is the uh, Polaroid One Step 600 flash close-up camera. I'm sure we got this camera at one of the local thrift shops. I don't remember specifically where it was picked up in, but as you can see that it is in its original packaging. Probably if it was packaged today it would be in a bunch of foam inserts and that sort of thing. That's not the way this camera came. It's pretty robust as it is. So this camera was produced by the original Polaroid Corporation. Um, as the video will state, there is a new Polaroid Corporation, which is not an American company, it's a Dutch company. So let's see what's inside the box. Um, believe it or not, the, most of the instructions to this camera are on the outside of the box. Uh, not the, <laughs> I'm sure there was, a, there was instructions originally. Um, it, uh, the instructions are long since gone, but interestingly enough, the, uh, uh, the receipt's still in the box. So let's take a look. Can see there's no room for any type of cushioning here it's just the camera the camera is much larger than normal analog cameras at the time as you can see here's the receipt from Costco of all places uh, it was originally thirty dollars about in 1997 May 12 1997 was bought at Costco so uh, that's kind of interesting. All right, so here we have the camera. Um, it's made of all plastic. There are no metal parts. The older SX-70s did have metal parts and leather. This is just a plastic. Uh, it does have a lanyard. Otherwise, it's self-contained. Uh, let's get the measurements. Six inches by... It does have a little extension, so call it uh, five and a quarter, six inch by five and a quarter by three and a half inches. Yeah, I'm not being consistent here. <laughs> 
Okay, so that's how much it, how large it is. Let's see how much this weighs. A pound and a third, roughly, 22.55 ounces. So we'll, uh, we'll call that 22 and a half ounces. So, pretty beefy. That's uh, probably with a dead Philip cartridge in it. Uh, we'll see what's in the camera in a second. Okay, so opening these cameras are pretty straightforward. Um, you just, uh, you know, to activate it, you, there's a, a lid here and it just pivots, as you can see. So you just uh, open the camera like this. As you can see in the front of the camera, you have this particular model has a flash, that's hence the name, there's a flash. Unlike typical SLRs, of course, you do not look through the lens, you look through the, the actual just view window. Instamatics and instant cameras and basic 35 millimeter cameras all came this way. Uh, there is a, um, an adjustment here manually for dark and light. You can move it back for dark to the left and light to the right. Uh, it does come with a close-up feature, which um, it says four feet if you don't put it in, which is the focus length. And then the focus length here, it says two to four feet. I, now, I've read online the focus length is different than what it shows here. It's hard to say. I've heard six feet, but we'll take a, we'll, we'll probably try the, the, uh, the close-up real quick and see if that does anything. All right. So... Um, that's it. Um, the button has the activation button is right here, so you can. Yeah, so it does work. There is no unit in here that powers the batteries. No, pa there's no power pack. There is uh, no batteries. You know, you don't put in AAA or AA or D batteries or whatever have you. That's just not available. The power pack is actually inside the film cartridge. An interesting feature of the time. So, to access the film cartridge, which you shouldn't do unless, of course, there is no film in it. This particular camera doesn't have any film in the cartridge. So, you can access the, the cartridge area by just simply clicking on this uh, button, and the, the lid will just pop right open. So, you can see in here, here's the cartridge. It does take, as it says here, 600 film. It has a nifty tab to help you pull it out. And, indeed, the cartridge is uh, dead. There is no film in it. So um, I'm sure the video said where the dimensions of the film. Film, it's a three and a half inch square picture that it takes with a white border. So it fits right in here. Um, there's really nothing more to this film. Now, other analog film of the time came in rolls and had only the film in it. Uh, and then you would snap a photo of the, of the roll. Here's uh, an example of, uh, this is actually a 35 millimeter uh, Advantix film, which is slightly more advanced, but it's the same principle. So it's in the roll versus, so this is what you would have. So you either have this kind of film th for 35 millimeter cameras, and you would take a picture, the film's in here, and then it, it would rewind into the into the canister, and you take this to a Photoshop, local drugstore, and they would develop it, and it would, uh, you know, as in, in the 90s, um, even the 80s with uh, Photomat, which was uh, a chain that went, went bankrupt in the 90s, but it, that's because you could go to the drugstore and get your film done in a day. Uh, it used to be you had to send these cartridges into Kodak. This particular film was made by Kodak. Fuji is the other major film manufacturer. And, you know, it would take two to three weeks and the film would come back developed from Rochester, which is kind of interesting. But um, so rather than this, so two to three weeks to Rochester or, you know, having to go to the photomat takes a few days or you go to the drugstore even the 90s or the 2000s, uh, uh, you could still get this film um, developed even today in a drugstore, um, you know, it's overnight, uh, even maybe even an hour, uh, if depending on the drugstore. Instead, you have this, uh, and here's the film. What happens is each film square has both the both the sensitive chemicals on it that allow you to that the picture, you know, light comes into the frame and it's reflected onto the film, and then the developer is applied when the film is ejected. So when the film comes out, then the developer is swept across the um, 
uh, the surface of the film and then it, it develops. So that was the innovation that Edwin Land had versus this type of film, which is only the photosensitive uh, chemicals. Okay, these cameras um, take, as I said, 600 film. You can buy 600 film new. This particular film says Polaroid Originals on it, which tells me that um, uh, it's older than March of 2020. March of 2020, the company changed its name to Polaroid because they got finally got a hold of the, the trademarks. Let's see here. We can open the box. Yep, comes in a sealed package, you know, as any film would. You just kind of... Uh, Plug it in here, slide it in, close the door, it ejects the top. The top is what keeps the, the uh, sunlight off of the uh, first exposure. And uh, you're ready to go, ready to go, point and shoot. Now these cameras don't focus, there are the models that do have a rudimentary focusing feature they call it sonar. I don't think it's actually exactly sonar, but anyway, it, it, it allows a, uh, it has a lens in it that uh, autofocuses. This does not. So if you take a picture of the, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, it'll just get blurriness. So I took a picture of this particular statement. Um, it pops out like this. You can see that the, when the picture pops out, there's a little slight wetness to it. Uh, it is safe to touch, although I wouldn't until it dries. Um, and then the film will develop. And what you'll get, the image here will be a, uh, you know, just a blurry, you know, you'll hardly ever see this. Because again, the focus length, even with the, uh, uh, the, uh, this special lens, it's just a plastic piece that allows it to focus at something shorter than four feet, says so two to four feet. So you can take pictures of flowers and whatever have you. So yeah, that's all there is to it. So, you know, point and shoot. It literally is that simple. These are extremely popular in the uh, 1970s. Uh, 1980s, um, film processing on 35 millimeter cameras started becoming more and more efficient. As I said, you could get your stuff done in, uh, in a few days and then, uh, overnight and then, uh, or, you know, in an hour, if you were, uh, wanted to pay for the additional service. So because they had, uh, 35 millimeter developing machines right in the stores, um, I think, uh, Kodak is the one who actually made them or Fuji. Um, so they're perfectly happy to sell these stores, these machines, and then they would do the developing. Just like, uh, you know, razor blades, it's not the camera that you made money on. You made money on the developing, you made money in the film, you made money selling these, you know, cartridges, um, you know, it's the Gillette model everybody likes to use, you know, it's, um, I don't know they ever made money on these cameras, um. They probably made a little bit of money. I mean, they could definitely cover their costs. It's, you know, Gillette at one time used to lose money or certainly uh, in some cases, uh, you know, make no money on their razor blade handles. But uh, nowadays, uh, if you look at Gillette pricing, you can see that they've kind of got out, gotten out of hand. They'll give you one blade and a handle for something like, you know, $20, <laughs> something ridiculous like that. So uh, these cameras uh, at the time you could buy inexpensively for less than $100. Very often the cheap models were certainly, you know, closer to 50 uh, As you could see, this particular model was uh, bought for $30 at Costco. Of course, Costco is a discount place, so which tells you that in 1997, when this was purchased, um, Costco had made a bulk buy or an arrangement with a manufacturer who made it with Polaroid to sell it cheaply. There's a lot more going on here with, a, with this than you get with a $30 camera nowadays. It's digital, that's for sure. Um, and of course, these analog photos have better than the 4K resolution by definition. In any case, if you have film that is not the freshest, uh, you can see how the developer and the uh, photosensitive chemicals were not as great on this particular. This was closer to the top in the pack. This is a different spot, um, the deck that uh, I took a picture. And it did faithfully render in the top, but you can see some smearing in the bottom. Again, film freshness really matters here. So, um, you know, this is a 100% okay picture. You can see with damaged film, you can start getting even more, even dicier. Here's another one of another spot uh, in the yard of a windmill. And the same thing, you can see some damage here in the chemical. Um, so um, 35 millimeter film is not as, as susceptible to this sort of thing. Um, you can get wash out and white out in this type of film, but um, it is a little harder. And the film does last longer in terms of freshness. So, 
So that's it. That's your Polaroid One Step 600 flash close-up in a nutshell. Before we get to the concluding segment, take a moment to subscribe if you have not already done so. The first major YouTube milestone is at 10,000 subscribers, and we are doing everything we can to get to that mark. Help us out by becoming a subscriber, and we will be sure to continue delivering great content to you. And please click the bell notification icon to ensure you are notified when new episodes are released. So, can you still buy the One Step 600 camera? You can! A Dutch company founded in 2008 called The Impossible Project reverse-engineered Polaroid film to serve a market that still wanted instant film. The film was a hit, and the company expanded its operations and changed its name to Polaroid Originals in 2017. The company changed its name again in 2020 to Polaroid after clearing the trademark issues with the original brand. The new Polaroid sells new instant camera models adapted to 21st century digital technology and refurbishes old cameras for resale. You can buy a refurbished One Step 600 flash close-up for $130. Polaroid 600 film and 8-sheet cartridges are also available for $19 in single packs on the Polaroid website, and double packs can be purchased on Amazon for $35. Prefer the modern conveniences of a digital camera? Polaroid sells modern One Step Plus iType digital cameras that can sync photographs you have taken via Bluetooth to a compatible device. And of course, the camera can print off pics using either 600 film or the new iType film, which at $16 for an 8 print cartridge is cheaper on account it does not have a built-in battery. The One Step Plus camera has its own power pack. What do you think of the Polaroid story? Did you know the company's impact on photography before the introduction of the iPhone? Share with us by dropping a comment below. We hope you enjoyed this 41st episode on the BTM channel. If so, click that like button. Links to some of our most recent episodes can be found in the description section below. You can peruse the entire 100 plus video library by looking at our playlists, which conveniently sort videos by subject. We announce all new videos on our Twitter account, as well as in the community feed for this channel. Want to know how to navigate our channel content? We refer to retro tech and innovation documentary segments as episodes. Coverage of current events in space exploration, science, and technology are labeled as shorts. Space and tech history are documented in an anthology called Milestones. And gameplay recordings can be discovered on the BTM channel in videos called Walkthroughs. Stay connected by occasionally checking our Instagram feed, where we post content from our upcoming episodes and from episodes past that you may have missed. And finally, join us on our Facebook page, where we cover current news and events related to channel content. Thanks for watching.